Welcome to Thursday Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My name is Jesse Ott, the host of this podcast, which is all about beverage innovation. I talk with innovation pioneers from agriculture to glass. Thank you for listening, and be sure to subscribe to be notified of all new episodes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday Thursdays. My name is Jesse Ott, and I have Peter and Scott here from from Bespoken Spirits. Hi, guys. How are you doing today? Doing great. Good to awesome, see you. Jesse, thank you. Yeah, good to see you guys. So it definitely looks like you are calling from two different spots. Peter, where are you calling from today? Uh, I'm actually calling from Fort Lauderdale, Florida today at my home here. And Scott? I'm in Lexington, Kentucky at our new facility for Bespoke. All right, new facility. I can't wait to dig into all the details. This is so exciting. So Peter and I met, uh, yes. gosh, was it right before the turn... Right before, like right at the end of December, maybe. So I know we've had to reschedule yeah, yeah. here and there. So super excited to have you guys on and talk about all the things you're doing, um, you know, with Bespoken. I know that you guys have a lot of awards behind you and uh, great product. So let's let's uh, let's dig in. All right. Yeah. Sure, sure. So who wants to start, um, you know, kind of from the beginning? Um, I'll start and then I'll tag in Scott. Okay to kind of add to it and um but so bespoken's been around for almost five years now um really they spent the first two and a half years or so just proving the concept of this technology uh the founders were they were scientists they basically they used science to create this amazing technology um i joined a little less than two years ago as the ceo uh, Scott joined about that's a year and a half ago or so. Um, no, about a year now. Wow, Scott, yes. it's gone. It's gone quick. So um, Scott's our COO. If I didn't mention that, and uh, so what we've done is we've evolved over the last couple of years into this now spirits company, and uh, we've developed not just our recipes and our technology. We've Entered in two, three new SKUs, a, a, a rye, a bespoken rye, a bespoken American whiskey, and a, a bespoken bourbon. And then we we did this fascinating thing last year. Uh, we started partnering with artists. Um, and our first artist was a band called Whiskey Myers. And we make a bourbon for them called Uncle Chickens. It's it's fantastic. Uh, one, just one double gold, was it, Scott? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And... Um, we also partnered with Leonard Skinner, and we make Hell House Whiskey, which is actually our biggest brand to date. Um, phenomenal partners. Uh, so it's just been this exciting journey since since I've joined. And I'll, I'll let Scott kind of tell you a little bit about his journey here and, and what he's accomplished. And Scott has really spearheaded this entire transition from our original space in California where we were producing to now in, in Lexington. So I'll turn it over to Scott from here. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So I'm... Uh, born and raised here in Lexington, Kentucky, and worked for, uh, who's now the chairman of our board of Bespoken. His name is TJ. If you hear us talk about TJ t- today, but um, worked for him for 16 years before he retired and went into venture capital. And he was one of the first investors in this technology. And I guess when Peter showed up in California, it, it only took several months before the two of them realized that uh, it, it didn't make a lot of sense um, financially. Uh, primarily to, to be making Shipping bourbon uh, and whiskeys in, in California. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so All right. Peter uh, came to Lexington to meet me. We uh, hit it off right away. Okay. And I was hired soon after to to bring Thank the company you. to my hometown here in Lexington. Um, so it's been, as okay. Peter will joke, I, I said I could do it six months and we're uh, <laughs> 11 months and five days in. <laughs> Not quite done. Uh, but we're, we're, we're right at the finish line. It's very exciting here in Lexington. Bye. Um, we've got the office set up. We now have uh, seven so full-time go. employees. Back. Uh, and Peter visits. He has an apartment. Is here at halftime. So seven and a half uh, um, in the like... office, which is great. Um, yeah. This one. So we're we're rocking and rolling, getting ready to make some spirits right across the parking lot here at Gray Line Station. Awesome. Yep. So we'll be... <laughs> talk, Peter. Talk a little bit about uh, the I'd... beginning of making oh. bourbon in California. Why? Was there a certain? I mean, obviously, if people live there, but secondly. 
um, was it just people they knew locally or access to warehousing or bar- barrels or the liquid? Like what were, how did that kind of come to fruition out there? Sure, sure. So, uh, it, the, the, the founders were based in Silicon Valley and it's, you know, tech country, tech world. And that's, you know, the, these big tech companies that just, blow up and explode so really they started out as a tech company you know this this the, the founder his name is martin janicek he he basically he basically said you know what i want to challenge the fact that something sits in a barrel for three years or five years or ten years why can't we with science figure out a way to do it better and faster and you know everybody has a different taste profile. Everybody's different. So I'm, I don't think we, everybody's going to agree or everybody's going to have the same philosophy, but we certainly do make some incredible spirits. His technology was just, it blew me away as a bourbon drinker for many years now. So what we, so that's where it started. The whole thing started in Menlo park. We had a, a lab there. We had offices there. And then we had a production facility in treasure Island, which is an Island just off in between Oakland and San Francisco Bay. And, um, so it, very small operations started out. Um, we quadru we forexed our businesses here. So we went from very, very small to four times bigger in, in just 12 months time. So it really shows you how the, the, the transition from, you know, this, this little startup company and we, we're still a startup company. Let's not, let's not joke. I mean, that we are, but at the end of the day, it was engineers and, and, and scientists that were trying to maneuver through this very complex alcohol world or the three tiered system here in, in the U S and it's, it's a very expensive and, and, and hard thing to do, especially if you don't have experience in it. So that's kind of where I came into play and, and I helped maneuver it. So like Scott said, I instantaneously knew the cost of doing business in the state of California. It's no secret. It's, it's uber mm-hmm. expensive. No, no pun. Intended. Especially on a little island. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, the first thing, you know, speaking to TJ Rogers, who's the chairman of our board, and he is a Silicon Valley legend. Uh, people have heard about him. I mean, here's, there's, he's written books. I mean, genius, smartest man I know. He, uh, he and I sat down. And I said, you know what? I think it's time for us to, to make a better business decision. Not just that, coming to the bourbon capital of the world isn't such a bad thing, especially when you're introducing this, this really, I would call disruptive, unique technology to the bourbon world. And, you know, spending those first two and a half years proving the concept, winning over 180 awards now, I mean, that's unheard of every single skew that we have created yeah. including the ones that we don't sell have won double gold medals so we're doing something right and i really believe in what we're doing and the technology uh it there, there's there is a leg to stand on here and uh i'm excited about it so peter i know that um you know you're you're like me you're in the industry you're not from silicon valley you don't have the science oh. background but can you explain a little bit about uh, or bridge that gap between what a, how a Silicon Valley person goes, oh, let's just break through this industry that, you know, obviously we don't change. We are now rapidly in the last few years, but how, how does that work? And can you translate some of the language of that technology that they, they were trying to break yeah. through to do it? Yeah. I'll actually, I'll let Scott explain the technology and then we'll, we'll together, we'll kind of explain to you how we've morphed it into the, this complex liquor industry okay. of ours. So Scott, go. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Peter and Jesse. So the, the technology that, that was invented by our, our chemist founder, Martin, uh, and Stu and, and Jordan, who's still with us, um, is, is no different than aging bourbon in a barrel in a rick house uh from the all the ingredients point of view there's no additives um it's it's a simple equation of of time uh temperature and surface area so it's it's where the liquid touches the wood uh where the magic happens 
And um, what we do is we control those variables with, with uh -huh. much more precision. Um, if you tour any distillery in Kentucky, you might get the chance, or, or Cooper H. Drilling, you might get the chance to see how they char an oak barrel. And they put the whole barrel together, the tops are missing, top and bottom, but it's a, it's a cylinder. And it, it moves along the conveyor belt, and there's a natural gas flame that shoots up through, and it's turbulent, and you see a lot of, uh, you know, activity in the flames. And it's simply a matter of of how long they char the barrel that just de determines the level of char. Um, most commonly, it's char level four, which is around fifty some seconds. Um, what we do is we take the exact same oak; it's brand new oak. Um, it's literally a, a slat, uh, a stave uh, of oak that you might use to make a barrel. Um, and we put it in an industrial oven and we toast it at a very precise temperature. We we'll do that for a very you know, precise amount of time. Uh, so we're able to get extremely consistent wood profiles. Uh, it's, it's kind of the number one pre precision element to our approach. Um, then we dice them into very small uh, micro stapes about the size of a half a pencil. Um, and that gives us a lot of surface area. So a, a barrel is nearly a sphere. And that, that geometrical shape is perfect for optimizing volume and minimizing surface area. And we're doing that exact opposite. We're throwing all these little chips of wood into a stainless steel container. Um, and so that we get 300 times the surface area uh, as, as a barrel would. And uh, the other vari variable being time, since we have uh, 300 times the surface area, we can drop the time down as well. So we're able to achieve equivalent levels of extraction of the wood into the distillate um, in, in dates instead of years. Um, with many other advantages in, in energy consumption, Absolutely. wood consumption, we use the entire volume of the wood instead of just the inner surface of the barrel. Um, we save water doing this as well. Uh, and we don't have the angel share issue. Not, the, not even talking about the fact that you have to own a rick house, you have to own the land, you have to, you have to pay for the inventory that's, that's aging on the shelf, which is, is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's science. I think the, the real advantage that we uh, have is the three years, as Peter mentioned, of R&D development, uh, where we learn all the nuances of the various different types of wood that we use, various variations on oak, um, the different, how we toast, how, how finely we, we cut, the, cut the wood with a laser, et cetera. Um, that's all in our database, our knowledge base. And so we're able to bespoke uh, a spirit, which means to custom craft the specific flavor profile and aroma profile that you're looking for with, uh, you know, with simple equations that we use to develop those recipes. So but very rapidly, we can come up with new and unique flavors for the varying palates in the world, right? So that's and, really the, the magic there. And, um, and is it all, what's, what's interesting oh, sorry. about that? Sorry, Jess. No, I was Go just ahead. wondering, you mentioned the staves, but what's the vessel that it ages in? It's a stainless steel okay. uh, stainless steel container, much like a fermenter. Okay. So it's a 300-gallon fermenter with a double wall jacket for uh, for forcing the temperature. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and what I was going to add to that is having this technology and access to being able to deliver specific flavor profiles in days allows us to create these artist partnerships. And what's different about us versus somebody who goes in and does a sponsorship or puts their name on a brand is the artist partner can actually come in and it, this is truly theirs. It's a one of a kind spirit. It's a one of a kind flavor profile that they've determined that is theirs and it will always be theirs. It's, it's their flavor profile. Yeah. And we have the technology to tweak things. If they want it a little smokier, they want it a little sweeter, they want it a little darker. So that's what the, the technology allows us to do. And it, it allows us to maneuver quickly. Whereas if somebody, an artist were to come into a big bourbon producer and say, I would like a bourbon that tastes like X, Y, and Z, they say, okay, come back in three years and we'll talk. And uh, that's, and maybe, maybe they find the exact taste profile that they're looking for. So that's the unique, dis the, or the d distinct difference between us and uh, the other producers with technology. And when you, when you talk about um, 
new oak is that uh, just american oak that you're using or are you getting different types of oak from around the world we use uh, both french and american oak those are the, the two that we're using right now okay you know <laughs> um makers mark does this program that i was involved in that's very similar to that and it's um really a cool program and um i don't know what your process is but it's you know, one where you go into a room and you um, taste all these different profiles and then you mix them all up and then you pick the one that you like the best. And that's kind of a cool experience and um, really kind of helps me understand a lot um, a lot more of what you guys are doing, I think, just having that experience and seeing them put those staves in there just to kind of, you know, adapt to those profiles, which is... Uh, and it was only a few months, too. Like you said, it was only... I think it was on the shelf and bottle within maybe six months or something. Um, so it, that's so cool. Uh, that <laughs> it's so in, it's so incredible that you come. You have these industry, you know, veterans at Maker's Mark doing doing this, and then you have a completely whole different world of people that are saying, "Hey, let's yeah. let's check this out. Let's how can we do this from a scientific, you know, standpoint?" And they're yeah. they're creating the exact same thing. Um, but obviously not branded, right? You get a lot more um, variability of profiles and flavors and grains and whatever it is that you want to do. It's like a blank slate. You know, you get to just kind of <laughs> yeah. cr create whatever you want, which is really cool. I love how, Peter, you were explaining dark, sweet, smoky. <laughs> you know, that's really incredible and very, um, very, you know, micro level, right? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, you know, technology is, is really interesting. It's, and it's always initially, I think humans are creatures of habit. So we, we, we hesitate some, or most hesitate to any kind of new technology. You think about computers, you think about electric cars, you know, Tesla wasn't nearly as sexy as it is today, even 10 years ago. And I think people are way more receptive to electric cars today than they were back then. And I think it's, it's the similar thing here with producing aged spirits. They've been making, they've been aging things in barrels for a long time. They've been doing it the same way for a long time. So yeah, I, I think the industry is poised for not a transition, but there's some changes to happen and, and things to get better and more precise. And I think that's that's kind of the direction that we're that everybody's going in, and I think these big publicly traded companies are yes. they're cognizant of the ESG factor, and and that that's a big deal, and uh, you know so they are trying to get better, and they are very aware of our technology, what we're doing, and I, I think everybody is any of the big players in this game, they're all looking at different ways of perhaps, you know, getting better and more precise and uh, a little more sustainable too. And I think we, we meet all of those, all that criteria. So would you agree, Scott? Yeah, yeah I agree completely. The, um, you know, we're not, we're not trying to compete with the, the uh, mature brands that are, that are out there that have been doing it the same way for uh, decades or if not a century. Um, mm -hmm. you know, as a Kentucky born and bred, uh, Kentucky boy, I'm, I love those bourbons. I still, still have some at my, at my house. And, uh, but this one has, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's, we're able to, I think, add a significant amount of value to what's already a, a good distillate, um, in a very short time, what's, what's very little amount of money. And I think their value in that technology is real, um, not necessarily a, a among the skeptics of, of, you know, the bourbon purists, um, but in, in the general general consumer market, I think we have a, an opportunity to do something different and unique um, that, that's really exciting. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah. I think it's good to have those purists, right? You want some tradition in the industry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this technology is is going to happen, right? You can't stop it one way or the other. So why not be a part of change? You know, I've seen time and time again, 
um, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, that have been in the industry a long time, they're, they're changing, they're changing what they're doing. It's, you know, it gets to be a challenge chasing goals and plans for these bigger companies. It gets to be kind of, you know, tiring, you know, and to be able to be a part of something new innovation that's going to happen, it kind of recharges yourself. It re kind of sets like your priorities of, of your, you know, how you conduct yourself throughout the day, but like how you relook at the industry and it's exciting again and it's fun. And, and you, you know, the, you don't have to be every every want everywhere, right? You don't have to be everything to everyone. You are you're very specific to who you are. You have a specific market, and then everybody gets to play, right? So I think it's super exciting what you guys are doing. It's very it's very technology driven, which I didn't realize um, at the beginning of you know when Peter and I first started uh, talking about this. Uh, and I think it's super uh, 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 interesting how two worlds collide, right? To me this you have the science silicon kind of perspective um breaking into this um this world which you know obviously you know when you're outside looking in it's glamorous it's fun it's exciting but we work really hard and um you know it is science right it's technology it always has been um you know whether you're a winemaker or a blender or master blender or whatever it is it's all science which is just really cool i think to have these two worlds kind of come together and create such a magnificent product. And obviously these scientists knew exactly what they were doing on uh, maybe not right away, <laughs> but they adapted quickly. Two and a half years is pretty quick to kind of come up with technology that can create a liquid this, this good sure. um, that you guys are producing here. So um, congratulations. And that's super exciting. I'm pumped for you. Uh, the more I learn, the more excited I get. Um, question about, how you select product for celebrities and what is that process and are you looking at doing this for clients or, or chains or any anything like that yeah that's that's a great question i'll, I'll run you kind of through yeah. the process with our artist partnerships so um last year we did the two one with whiskey myers and one with uh leonard skinner obviously and it's this really cool process of, all right, tell me guys, we'll, we'll have a a meeting and we'll say, what, what do you guys like? What do you drink? You know, and Leonard Skinner was famous for drinking Crown Royal on stage. Like they would have a, a bottle. So we, we kind of knew, hey, we know that flavor profile. It's a Canadian whiskey. I don't know. We're not going to do a Canadian. We could, but we... They wanted an American whiskey, but they wanted a specific profile. So what we did is we took what they said, and then we created, Scott, was it five or six different samples? Five, five yeah. initial ones. Yeah, so five samples, and it was, Jesse was hilarious. We, we get on this Zoom call, the entire band, and we're tasting them one at a time, and we're going through the profiles, and, you know, and everybody's got a different opinion, and then they say, okay, we really like this one, but we'd like you to tweak this slightly. And we're like, okay. So we, we take that one, we do it, we do another call and they're like, perfect. So that's kind of the, how we do it kind of a uh, uh, thing. Um, when it comes to um, doing like barrel programs or, or, or private labels or things like that with per, perhaps a chain, we, we have the okay. capabilities of doing that too. Sure. It's, it's, that's again the beauty of the technology is is just that, and um, yeah. So it, it's 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 fascinating. We'll do we're gonna do another artist partnership uh, this year, and then we'll do another artist partnership in 2025, and uh, we'll, we'll probably hold steady to there. And then as the new facility comes into play, <clears throat> we'll have people coming in for tours. You know, we would like the opportunity for people to have the chance to actually taste and, and create their own profile of a, of a, of a bourbon or a whiskey. And, um, and that's the vision, uh, Scott, you can go into, you know, the things that we do from, uh, the private label sector with, with things that we've done in the past and going forward, what the vision looks like from a production standpoint. Yeah. Happy to Peter. Thank you. So, um, you know, the technology is fast. 
uh, that that's the the beauty of it. Uh, this is a, a one liter, um, sorry, five hundred yeah. milliliter um, container that we use for these experiments, and we can run thirty of those in parallel. So, uh, in a matter of a week, we can turn around thirty new flavors that the world has never seen before. Um, and so that, with the knowledge and the database of of recipes yeah. that we have, is what really enables us to to yeah. leverage the artist partnerships. Yeah. And the reason to do that is simple. They have a built in exposure. Uh, they give yeah. us a built in exposure to their fan base, uh, where we can rapidly get eyeballs on the product first um, to the millions of people, that, which then translates into hundreds or thousands that, that the, people get the chance to taste it. Uh, and then hopefully purchase a bottle. So yeah. that's the acceleration in marketing that our speed, uh, our speed and R&D really, really promotes. Um, that same process is viable for, for large chains. So a big chain that wants their own product that's unique uh, and that sets them apart from their, their competition, we can do that. And we're engaged in some, you know, some exploit, exploratory uh, avenues there. Um, but what I'm excited about, uh, among all of this is that I think we can scale it down literally to the individual consumer, um, where, where the consumer could follow the same flow that, that the band Leonard Skinner did. They can come into this room, uh, maybe yeah. before they come make an appointment, give us their favorite brands, their favorite flavors. We'll put together five samples for them. They come here, they taste if they like one great. If not, we can tweak, we tweak their favorite one. choice and come back in a week. Um, and then literally a month later, we could have uh, a case of, of their own very own whiskey for them, um, <laughs> even at an individual consumer level. Wow. So it's scalable throughout. We're obviously focusing on artists because of their reach uh, into the consumer, consumer base. Um, but it's that's the really exciting part of the technology to me. Yeah, there's so many different facets to this that you know, I, I really feel like we barely scratched the surface of what we can do as a company and as with this technology and it it just you, you've got a there's an old saying you got to eat your elephant one bite at a time because there's a huge elephant to, to eat out there and you know for us it's being being savvy being smart being focused and, and really attacking this thing in, in the appropriate manner and and taking it step by step and understanding this is a process it you don't explode in one right. day you know it takes step-by-step -step process to to get to a point where um it's you know you become this, this mega company um and and hopefully you know we're, really for me and and i i believe for scott too and i don't want to speak for him but it's it's really enjoying this process of going through this and it's 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 hard and it's at times painful and but the journey it's, is, is, is just, it's so fascinating doing this. I've been in this alcohol business for 20 plus years and you, you find yourself almost on the hamster wheel. Once you've figured out how to do this and do it well, it, it almost becomes second nature. So you, you had mentioned earlier in the podcast that, you know, it's exciting and it kind of reinvigorates you when you think about this technology. I remember interviewing for this position and just you know, thinking to myself, man, this is disruptive technology. And I felt like I was just getting into this industry again. That same excitement kind of bubbled up inside of me. And so it, it's kind of the driving force for me, at least. And I believe for Scott, too. You know, I, mean, I don't want to speak for you, Scott, but <laughs> how do you feel about that, Scott? Here. No, I, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I was, I am an engineer. I was working in electrical engineering in a Silicon Valley company uh, my entire career. And uh, as, as Peter experienced, ironically, in, in, in the alcohol industry, um, I was coasting. You know, things were, things were easy, um, but there wasn't a lot of new learning. And so coming here has been completely reinvigorating. Um, I feel like a kid again, learning every day. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of the the excitement um, behind it, and I think you know, as consumers, we get we we're excited for that too, right? The new brands, new energy, different way of looking at it. Um, you know, there's never been more brands than now exploding, and which to your point, Peter, this industry is hard. It's hard, 
it, especially being a startup, um, you know, brand and how do you make more noise mm. than the other one? Uh, you know, you guys are partnering with, um, you know, big, big brands, uh, you know, in terms of your partnerships. So I think that's certainly going to elevate your, your brand, you know, higher mm -hmm. than, than others, but it's still that brick and mortar piece yeah. that you still have to kind of hit the streets, get in the accounts, get the, t you know, liquid to lives, all that kind of, but um, you know, aspect of it, get distribution, you know, state by state, which is brutal, <clears throat> especially because there's so many, mm. uh, you know, yes. brands out there. But, you know, I think also the industry is changing. You know, you've got LibDiv now. It's making it more accessible to get to more markets. So I think, you know, having that partnership with RNDC, they get it too. Uh, I was just talking yep. to a colleague of mine. You know, you see all this consolidation. I see it going back the other way. Because it's, it's not that they're not trying. It's just that the, 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 the economics behind it isn't set up for it anymore. Uh, you know, where you, you have mm -hmm. the smaller houses maybe offering a little bit more. Um, but there's so many brands, there's enough room for everybody, right? So I, I, I think it's an oh, extremely great. exciting time. And uh, this is a very exciting project. Congratulations on all the, on the awards. That's, that's <laughs> like... I, I, I would like to have been a fly on the wall with those scientists on that island <laughs> going, okay, well, what flavor, <laughs> what flavor profile did they come up with where it was like, oh man, this is good. <laughs> or, or to Scott's point, did you just have 30 just go boom? <laughs> Cause you hit one and yep. out of the ballpark and it's like, okay, let's try bacon. <laughs> let's try peaches. <laughs> right. Oh, cinnamon. <laughs> let's do cinnamon toast crunch. Like what, what was that process? Like, I just, I'm so curious to know, um, that they can fine tune it to, you know, such specificity, you know, to it is incredible. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I, I'm always fascinated with, you know, just, somebody to have that the wherewithal to kind of just say you know what i want to buck the trend i want to i want to i want to understand why things have been this way for so long and why we can't do it better and so i admire that a lot um any human being that is has the capabilities of going beyond and and taking things to the next level is uh, they kudos to them um I try to do that, <laughs> but I don't know. From a science standpoint, I, I, I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm definitely the, the more business savvy, and you know, and I've got my PhD, Scott Savage here, who's who's, who's <laughs> brilliant, at, and he, he's, he does an incredible job for us here. Yeah, I can assure you guys, the the engineering and the science behind it is not nearly as glamorous as as you think it might be. <laughs> um, you know, literally, it's it's hours and days. Uh, tweaking one variable. So today we're going to toast the French oak to 350 and tomorrow we toast it to 400. And then we throw it in, in this container and we activate it. And then we characterize it with both scientific instruments, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. But most importantly, we give it to a, a panel of sensory experts. You know, we, we've learned that uh, there's there not, aren't instruments in the world, at least none that we can even come close to affording, uh, that can discern exactly what what compounds in the in the bourbon is making making it successful um and then the next day we come in and now we're going to try charring the wood and we're going to try french versus american whatever all those little variables that literally over three years you tweak one at a time and you measure how it works and then you tweak another one and you measure how it works and over time you can build a database of knowledge and put a little math That's behind right. it and you've got some boring equations that say i want yeah. happy van winkles and and there there it is so uh not quite there yet, but that's that's the the boring methodical engineering behind behind the uh, the process. Yeah, you're right. It takes a lot of data points and a lot of a lot of practice. Here, you know, also 350 degrees versus 400 that could change just a little yeah. bit, but it could make it work better with something else. You know, it's it's really fascinating. Uh, but you're right. That is a mm -hmm. process that. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't going to be a time in <laughs> a time when one fly is going to be on a wall experiencing something. It's really more of a um, you know database and a logarithms and whatnot. You're right. Uh, that is the eureka moments though, and when 
when you have their eureka moments though or, or yapsi or ring the bell whatever you want to do we need to get a bell feeder in here yes. in the office um, okay but yeah okay, right. you come and then it's really exciting everybody runs around and we're all trying to sample and like we this is a great one you know when those pop out it, it's really exciting yeah oh that'd be fun to be there you'll have to uh you'll have to get a <laughs> I'll get in the conference room or something and reenact what that's like so that we can see what, the, what their reaction is. You hit the red button. It's time to celebrate. You know, it's funny, Jesse. I always, I always wanted to do like a documentary of what we're doing. Like, you know, not just this technology and, and, and the experiments, but building this company and then building brands and, this all encompassing journey that we're on, it's, 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 it's fascinating. And it, you know, documenting something like that would, would be just awesome because I, 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 I feel like we're on to something really tremendous here and perhaps even historical. And I, I'm, I'm excited about it and I would have loved to do that, but you know, we'll just document it on your, there your, you your podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll be fun no you know a lot of times yeah. you know I, and i have a lot of startups you know that come on the podcast and once in a while we'll talk about how how you know how many people have said hey you should really be documenting this or you know i've had people say that too like just get on your iphone and just start talking and then then you learn how to mm -hmm. edit and you're like who's gonna edit that <laughs> it's so much yeah. you know to kind of sift through um but but you're right such great it golden is. nuggets in there that you could share yeah i was i was in my garage uh last weekend and i pull i was kind of moving things around and i had a big whiteboard and it had the entire organization structure and the plan that i had written probably the first week i was with this company oh my goodness how different it looks today <laughs> versus the plan <laughs> It was like, I was like, uh, what was I thinking? <laughs> so, but you, you learn so much during the, you know, the journey and the process mm -hmm. and it's, it's, but it's good to always look back and understand just how far you've come and, and just, you know, the amount of accomplishments, I think is we get sometimes get caught up and, um, at the, the end game and, and results. And you got to also appreciate the work and the journey that you've been on and, uh, and sometimes pat yourself on the back. You know, I, I like to do that with our team. And we always, we start every board meeting that we have talking about where we've come from and how far we've come and what we've learned. And I think that's, that's the most important thing is always learning and always getting better um, throughout the journey. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad you do that because <clears throat> you're growing fast now and you're going to forget, right? So I'm glad that that's kind of core mm -hmm. of who you are because, um, you know, growing four times, sure, it's a small base, but that's going to grow exponentially mm -hmm. when you, you've you got seven people, you're going to hire more people at some point and um, get more touch points. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a core, good core belief to kind of, um, you know, remind yourself because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really big deal. I mean, not all companies can can accomplish what you guys have in such a small amount of time. So you should applaud those and um, really appreciate it and, and, and love the journey. It is hard, but it is fun. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it, there's never a dull moment. Nope. <laughs> Just say that. <laughs> and no day is the same as the other. It's, it's very, you're always maneuvering through, you have, five problems that you 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 fix and then the next day you just step into the next set of uh uh challenges that you have to maneuver through so yeah it's scott and i every now and again we'll just kind of look at each other and we'll kind of nod and we'll say yep it's <laughs> 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 <Some> good stuff <laughs> good stuff well you know i've i've learned to understand that it's good for your brain right like like scott you're talking about you know, not learn anything. I've been in that same place, not learn anything, not growing. Like your brain needs that capacity and those challenges and, you know, those changes. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really healthy for your brain and longevity. That's what I've learned. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, <laughs> but that's what I've read. It's pretty cool. I, I would agree with that a hundred percent. 
you know, it's always, always moving forward, always learning. And, um, you know, I, that's kind of our philosophy at Epo Spoken Spirits, always, always growing, always learning, never, let's not make the same mistakes twice. We're going to make mistakes and it is stimulating for the brain. It, it for sure. I, I think, I don't think I've ever been happier in my life and, and I've never been more challenged in my life. And it's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's an awesome I'm so period. happy to hear that. Well, with yeah. that, I think my brain cells are ready for some, uh, some, <laughs> some really yummy liquid. <laughs> we started. To die, that's by okay. The way, so. That's okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather wait. <laughs> I, I have opened them, but I haven't tried anything yet. So, uh, Scott Peter says Pardon? that, um, I should turn to you for which, which one I should try first. She has all five, oh, Scott. Have, uh, do you have all five of our I choices? Mm -hmm. And and the big question is, are we going to go through all five? Because that'll that'll change my uh, change my yeah. answers. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> we'll start with Hell House. That's that's the American whiskey. Okay. Uh, this one, while you're while you're pouring there, it's um, again. This is the one we made for Leonard Skinner. There's awesome. the bottle. Um, we uh, put it on the shelves in July, right at the very end of July. Uh, and it quickly became our, our best seller. Um, in my opinion, it's the most accessible. Uh, it's 90 proof, which uh, yeah. is, matches our lowest proof offerings. Uh, it is a, it's a 90% corn American whiskey. And then we blend in with it some uh, straight rye. Uh, so the rye, the 10% rye adds a lot of the color and spiciness uh, that you're gonna notice. But it's, it's yeah, very deep amber. Yeah. Um, the rye was of course in a barrel to call it a rye. It has to be, uh, has to be put in a, in a barrel. Um, but the corn whiskey was not at all. So 90% of the liquid never saw a barrel. Um, that's some of the, uh, the advantage that we have in, uh, you know, sustainability and in wood. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in Lexington and when I was, uh, until I was really around 20, 2000 or so, um, I started meeting some wine people and they said, how do you, how do you taste bourbon and tell me what the flavors are? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, the wine, the wine people are, this is nuances of, of whatever it is. And, uh, but I had the opportunity to take a class, uh, from Weta Michael, a local chef. And what she, what she told, told us was taste some different flavors and then, and then drink the spirit. And if it, if you feel like they work together, then that's what you're getting. If they're opposite, then that's not, that's not what you're getting. And then took it a, a step further when let's say, we, you know, we don't have caramel, vanilla, we don't have almonds, et cetera, in front of us. You can, but I think you can actually just think about it. Just think about uh, toasted almond and then take a sip of the Owl house. And I think you'll find that you, you sense toasted almond. Um, if you say, uh, vanilla with this one particular one, I don't think you're going to get a, a lot of that, that same flavor. So, um, that's where I found the value in the tasting notes, which I'm not qualified to write, but we have people that are, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, this one, you're going to get some toasted almond, uh, yep. Yep. some dry, just some dried okay. fruit. And then that rye will give you some baking spices on the end, I think. Um, <laughs> Hellhouse whiskey. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Cheers. I'm Cheers. Sipping my uh my old fashioned. You got an old fashioned with this one. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's with rye. It's our green mm. rye label. That's green rye. Wow. Yummy. I mean, it smells so clean too. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of um, high corn content. Uh, for me, it's they're mm -hmm. creamier, smoother. Um, not, I mean, kind of sweeter, but you know, not overly sweeter. Just, it's just my profile. I just love it. And I, rye is, um, you know, who doesn't love rye? <laughs> it adds so much character and flavor and spicy notes and, really? and fun, um, explosion yeah. of flavors, you know? Yeah. And we've really found the, the high corn light whiskeys to be particularly amenable to our technology for our process. It's, it's pretty much a, a blank slate, um, yeah. that we can really tune. Um, you know, when you start with what we'll try next, a, a good bourbon, it's going to be a good bourbon and you can enhance it a bit. Um, but really the, the light whiskeys are, 
uh, are really the core of now three of our SKUs. I love it. All right, Scott, what, what are we doing next? That one was awesome. Go to the Dystokin uh, bourbon. Bourbon. Blue label bourbon. Okay. Blue. That's what I'm drinking. So, all right. I know it's backwards, mm -hmm. but. So this is uh, a 21% rye, 75% uh, yeah. corn. Uh, so a reminder for all of those listening at home, uh, it has to be at least 51% corn. Uh, and it has to be, um, has to touch a brand new charred oak container uh, right off the still. And of course, so we do that, uh, we, we do put it in a barrel, um, but it's a relatively new fill. So this is a pretty young bourbon. Um, we bring it then into our facility and, and add, um, for this one, it's a blend of French and American oak staves. Okay. Um, so we get, we get a good, good bit of maturation, uh, from, from that combination, um, pretty highly toasted as well. So another deep yeah. amber color, um, mm -hmm. even, even with only a few months in the barrel. So this one, you should get, uh, some of the darker, uh, chocolatey toffee, uh, and toasted, toasted nuts, um, yeah. from this one. Yeah. Definitely toffee. This one won the double gold at uh, San Francisco in 2022. Was the most recent uh, double gold we got yeah, on that coffee, one. Coffee, chocolate. Yeah, for sure. Butter. You can smell the butter. Like the it, 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 the internet says fig butter, but yeah, you can certainly you can you can get those flavors. It's really cool. Very smooth. Yeah. Certainly has um, wow. um, a Oof. different profile on the on the palate. Uh, definitely makes my mm -hmm. my mouth water. Uh, feels darker, Doesn't like a be... darker flavored uh, than the Hell House. Yep. You know, Jesse, when I interviewed for the job, you know, a couple years back. Um, you know, I love the technology and I was like, oh my gosh, this, I, I've got to do this. And then I was like, oh my God, I haven't tasted it. <laughs> it's like, so I was like, um, I should probably taste it, <laughs> you know, before I, I make this life commitment, you know, this journey. And that, that bourbon that you just tasted was what I, 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 I had. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, it was, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I was growing up in this industry drinking, you know, makers and Buffalo trace mm -hmm. and all those. So I was, I was pleasantly surprised. So yeah, hundred percent. But the, yeah, this is the next one, which Scott will get into. This is actually my favorite one in our por portfolio. Go ahead, Scott. So this one, I'll tell a brief story. So this is the whiskey Myers uh, expression called uncle chickens sipping whiskey. Okay. I encourage you to, to Google that and look up uh, why it's called Uncle Chickens. Uh, from best I can tell, that was the the rowdy guy in the huh. in the back of the bar when the band was evolving. Um, that was causing lots of ruckus, and they would always ask who who brought Uncle Chickens to the party. Um, my personal story with this one is I started in in February last year, twenty three, and we were in the middle of of, of making this brand. And meanwhile, the band was, was planning to tour and come to Lexington, uh, in June, I think it was June, maybe no, it was May, late May. And, uh, it killed me, but we were a week or two away from, from me actually getting a bottle and bringing it here. Uh, the labels, the labels were the last thing we got in to make the liquid, but I was so close to, to meeting them on stage with, with the bottle of their juice. Um, this is a straight bourbon. So this is, uh, same, same mash bill as the blue label. So it's 21% rye, 75 corn, 4% malted barley. Um, but this one uses, um, French oak staves, okay. uh, solely. Um, so it's, again, you're going to get the rich amber color. Um, <laughs> there's a nice psychedelic uh, print on the inside of the label that you'll only get to see if you drink the bottle. <laughs> well, there's the, my goal. The liquid is, is pretty dark. <laughs> That's your reward right there. Um, it's your home. All right. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't have to take it's, a test it's, on it. It's similar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Scott. There you go. Oh, 
Yeah, Hell House <laughs> is the same one. There's a nice picture on the back of that label on the inside. Oh. Uh, yeah. Again, you have to drink it to Double see it. Double duty. Yes. Shucks. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tough job, Jesse, Someone's but somebody's got to do, do it, right? I feel you know? like I can smell the French oak on here. Maybe I'm crazy, but I, I feel like it's that lighter, mellower sort of kind of crisp French oak. I don't know. Yeah, this one is oh, uh, 94 fruit, just as the blue label. And um, I've, I've done blinds on, on the blue label and Uncle Chickens. Um, you know, the difference being the wood variety and and the aging of the original distillate um and i think either, each time i choose the other one so i i can't decide which one <laughs> i like better i like them both a lot yeah 100 percent. those are flagship bourbons so those if you're a bourbon lover they're true bourbons they they met the brand new chart oak container uh off the still they met all the proofing requirements etc um and, and they're a good good bourbon yeah offering. that's delicious and, 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 Smooth, clean, yeah, that's really nice. I it says fig butter and toffee on here too, but I don't get it as much as I do the other one. This one's like like a cleaner version of it, almost like a lighter um, version of the heavier notes that we got in the last one. Yeah, the French oak definitely mellows that one out a little more than the the blue liquid. Scott, did, what award did the Uncle Chickens just win? It was a tag. <laughs> I believe it was, Peter. I don't have it at, at my fingertips, but I believe it was. Yes. Yeah. Were Were you all at WSWA? Just curious. Yeah, I'm not allowed in. No, unfortunately, we missed that one. Well, you can't. It's a... yeah. No, we we're 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 in such a, a young yeah. stage that we'll probably go to. It'll be in Orlando next year, so we'll probably go join in Orlando next year. Yeah. Uh, we've been so busy this year that it just it didn't make sense for us to go this year. But, yeah, that's always a fun place to go, WSWA. Anyway. Yeah, actually. I wasn't. Go ahead. Oh, I've just, I haven't Sorry. ever been. No. No? Oh, I thought you went this year. I didn't year. go this year. I, I okay. thought about it. It just kind of, to your point, I'm just, I'm not quite... <laughs> Not quite ready to to do that yet, but next year for sure it'll be in Orlando. Yeah. I'll be here, so um, yeah, yeah, next year for sure. Yeah, I'd love to go. I know um, there's a lot of really cool things happening out there, um, different partnerships, and you know, I, I always like to go and I have my little spies because I want to see what what's happening. You know what what new initiatives are they kind of looking to, and I'm just curious as to. Sure how your category would fit in um, to WSWA this year. Yeah, so am yeah. I. So am I. I think, um, I think the distributor partners across the country um, initially are intrigued by the artist partnerships, you know, that they, they show interest. And then the, it's then understanding the technology and then going, huh, you know, that that makes sense. That's, that's, that is disruptive for sure. So, you know, we've got some great distributor partners across in, in our, the 10 States that we're in currently. And, you know, eventually we hopefully will be in every state. And, um, so I think next year we will certainly go to WSWA and Jesse, you yeah, should I will. too. <laughs> should. I yeah. really want to promise. <laughs> I'm at a 99.9% .9 promise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Go walk. Okay. Hey. If nothing else, just to, to go and, and, <laughs> and meet people. I've met so many people, you know, just on the, the podcast that are going that I'd love to, that I have never met, you know? So. Yeah, it is a huge networking of huge, massive. And, uh, you know, it's not just distributors, it's brands, it's, you know, these sales and marketing arms, you know, so it's, it's, new technology not i'm not talking our technology but you know pos systems there's so much oh, that so goes much. on there that you know you really get an opportunity to see what's you know the newest and and coolest thing going on there for sure yeah and i didn't really get you know you, you see pictures and stuff but with with that to your point peter you don't really mm -hmm. get that online or you don't get that you know 
in a video. They don't really summarize it up. So I think you're to your point, it's really beneficial to check it out at some point. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Scott, what's 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 next? I'm making my own little mix over here, by the way. Man. I'm adding all the left excellent I the love leftover it. in here. So all right, maybe next we'll... we're gonna bump it up to um to our green label rye. Okay. We'll uh, go with our green label rye whiskey here. So this is uh, ninety five percent rye on the mash bill, uh, five percent five percent malted barley. Um, it's at a hundred proof, which is a very yeah. traditional proof level for for a rye yeah. whiskey. Uh, this one won double gold in New York uh, two years ago, twenty twenty one actually. Uh, it's almost three years ago now. Uh, this one, I'm I'm fascinated by the color. Uh, we're able to get a very deep uh, color uh, that comes from charring the, the wood as well. So we actually, uh, in addition to toasting it in the oven, uh, we we char the the oak staves one by one. Each, each stave is each micro stave is charred. Um, this one's going to be bold and spicy. You'll get some of the more bitter uh, nut flavors like walnut, um, baking spices. Um, some maple characteristics in there as well on the sweet side, uh, but it's it's a solid ride that we think stands up with with some of the best out there. Yeah, no, I I snuck a sip. It's it's <laughs> it is wonderful. I really like this one. Um, yeah, caramel maple. Uh, I love I love the color. That color is awesome. And can you explain just a little bit about you said the the chip or the micro save is is um charred like how what's that process like how does that what does that look like literally put it on a, a hot plate so a very hot um steel surface um and we just place them on there for about 30 seconds um it's ripping at probably six or seven hundred degrees um so as soon as you put it on there you see smoke um, start to start to come from the wood as it starts to burn, and then we quench it very rapidly in in water, um, then dry it out and put it in put it into the the system. So when you talk about sustainability, that's pretty key right there, right? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we, you know, as most uh, most rye mm -hmm. barrels are charred you know, heavily to the char four level, again, about a minute over the open flame. Um, and that is, again, very uh, invariable or, or very variable, right? There's a lot of, of uh, differences in the day, in the wood, in the, in the environment, in the room, et cetera. Um, and so with our precision, again, uh, each stave is very consistent. Um, you know, one thing unique with what's bespoken is um, I get the question, are we going to do a barrel select? And my first response is, well, we, we don't really have barrels, right? I mean, we do for the bourbons by law. Um, we do for the rye again by law, but they're in the barrel for a short time. Um, and the variability that you see in a rickhouse, which is why barrel programs exist, uh, we don't have. So it's not like we have some of our inventory that's way better than the rest of it. It's very consistent. So we can, we can bespoke a flavor. We can tune the wood, we can tune the char, we can tune the toasting, the time that it's in there, uh, the wood loading more importantly, um, to make, make custom spirits. Um, and that, that's our plan, but we, there's no variability for us to exploit, which is what all the barrel select programs are really doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, you don't you don't need to. <laughs> I mean, if you can have a consumer come in and do a tasting right there at your conference room, you don't need you don't need it. That's pretty impressive. I, I can't wait to hear more about that at some point. I'm enjoying a uh, an old fashioned that we that's a, a barrel a bar a bar barrel top old fashioned. So this is something we're experimenting experimenting with. It's based on our rye, but we've we we're looking at sourcing you know small bar top. Uh, barrels, you know, a couple of liters. I think this one was three liters, um, where you you mix the rye whiskey with with some simple syrup and the other ingredients, bitters. Um, let it let it sit on its own for for two four weeks, um, and then you've got a, a custom pourable cocktail at the bar. 
um, that is, you know, you get, you, you can make an old fashioned in as fast as you can pour it out of the barrel. Um, and it saves the bartenders a lot of time shaking up and mixing the, the, the spirits. Um, and that's, that's something we're, we're experimenting with as well. I'm really enjoying this one. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love old fashions. They're, <laughs> they're like my potato chip. I just love them. <laughs> I really do with the cherry. Oh. Yeah, great idea. Yeah. If you can get it to well, the right a, price point, you'll kill it. Well. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if that's the case, you're going to love our next one here. Yay. I'll let Scott. I, I won't steal Scott's thunder. How about that? All right. So next up is our red label. So now we're going to take a hard right turn and go to something completely different. So this one is our, our head scientist. Uh, we struggle with what to call him. Uh, not really a master blender, not really, um, you know, master creator, but so we call him the, the master of flavor. Master of flavor. Uh, Jordan, who, who this is his baby. Um, this is a 80% corn. Again, that light whiskey that we feel is a great uh, palette for us to, to, to build upon. And we mix that with 20% mesquite smoked malt. Um, and that is, uh, so it's, it's not a single malt. So it's 80% corn, 20% malts, um, smoked over mesquite. And the intent there was to create something akin to scotch, but of course we don't have peats, uh, in, in the United States to dry out, um, the grains. So we have a partner that's, that's helping us mesquite smoke the malt. So it's very smoky. Um, and this, this one we found bartenders love because they can make a smoked old fashioned, uh, without all the smoke, without the, um, without the fire and the contraption to, to make the smoke in the bottles. And so it saves them a lot of time and, and it really does create a, a very smoky, um, a drink at the end of the day. <clears throat> I think you'll also enjoy it neat. Um, this is 90 proof. It's, um, th this is the, the one in our, in our lineup that is never touched a barrel. So this consumed no wood containers whatsoever. So from a sustainability standpoint, uh, it's kind of the pinnacle of where we, where we are and where we can be, uh, long-term. Um, so all of this is white dog that we have then matured in our, with our micro stakes. Interesting. Um, one of our, one of our buddies here in the office, uh, who, who we hired, he's our customer experience manager. So if you come, come see the site and tour with us, you'll definitely meet Jared. Um, the first time he tasted it, we were tasting with him and he immediately, immediately yelled out peanuts. <laughs> and so everyone in there was like, oh, don't say anything. Now we're all tasting peanuts. And, and, but it really, it really tastes like uh, roasted peanuts to me, peanut butter. Um, ironically, Barbecue. not ironically, the, uh, well, I guess it is ironically. Um, the inventor of peanut butter is, it's from this region and the original GIF plant, uh, in, in the world is about a mile, uh, from our facility here. No way. Uh, where we're living. So it's our homage. Oh, I eat that almost every GIF day. I love Jiffy. <laughs> uh, so do I. So do I. I love you know, that stuff. Apple slices yes. and Jif peanut butter. I had butter. a pear today. <laughs> butterscotch. I get butterscotch, right? I mean, it's light. Certainly, um, you know, you can see the colors lighter too. So it's, it doesn't mm -hmm. have those dark, those darker notes. It's more light. Um, I do see the, uh, beef carpaccio. I'm not getting, <laughs> not getting that <laughs> yet, <laughs> which is awesome. I love beef carpaccio. <laughs> that sounds yes. delicious. I'm getting uh, hungry. Vanillas <laughs> and yes, totally all that. Um, jalapeno cheddar. <laughs> I could get the cheddar. I got some, hell I get some cheddar. <laughs> oh yes <laughs> this is so fun yeah that's smoky yeah, yeah. i love the smoky uh i <laughs> that mm -hmm. yeah that is delicious <laughs> oh my goodness oh uh, okay. yep green chili i get that uh bar definitely smoke barbecue um yeah we just that's all i taste i'm like barbecue we're a big I need yes, ribs. we just had them. We're <laughs> we're a big yep. green chili family. My my wife is from New Mexico, and uh, her family yep. was in from Japan, so she made her signature uh, mac and cheese with green chili. Oh, 
so good. This would have been oh, awesome. That sounds, I guess. If this... Yeah, that's really fun. Yeah, it's 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 unique, and and again, that kind of goes back to the whole mm-hmm. technology. We're creating these unique taste profiles that you know you you're just not finding. That's and I try to use the American whiskey as as when we meet with potential artist partners and we say, look, these are unique flavor profiles that aren't out there, and it's it's you that gets to create what you like and what makes special makes it special to you so um and this is the perfect i think the rye and the american whiskey really kind of show that and um and and that's i'm really proud of this one and the rye delicious but 100 percent distinct different original yeah and Mm -hmm. you guys can really push the boundaries with this too and get funky and fun you know i remember the days when peanut butter (laughs) whiskey was crazy (laughs) remember that yeah it's like the second largest (laughs) launch you know brand launch (laughs) or at least in my world it is in the in 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 the military but um Mm -hmm. like for me if you were to say hey jesse what do you want i was like first i was all over bacon and maple and now i'm like oh jiffy is that close yes (laughs) (laughs) chocolate Green chili, spice, smoke, yeah, go for it. <laughs> it'd be so fun. Do that. Yeah. Oh, it'd be so fun. Yeah. That is just mm-hmm. so cool that you guys can do the, all this magic. It's so cool. It's really special, um, and it's very unique. I, I can't wait to talk to you guys uh, long term about how we can work together on this because this is so fun. <laughs> I definitely want to be a part of this yeah. if I can. Um, yeah. Come do a podcast in yeah, Lexington. Yeah, that'd be yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah be we fun. Could, we could do a little segment on your on your experience on in the end of March. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Love that. Interview different parts of, of the company. Get your documentary going. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. The insights. <laughs> bespoken. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> oh man. Peter, be spoken. You could go back. If you could go back one year with with Netflix following you you around, would you choose to re- repeat the last year, or do you like where we are today? Yeah, I I, I really like where we are today. I mean, I think, um, you know, clearly, you know, you you make mistakes along the way, and and you learn from it. I I think, look at, at as the leader of the company, I everything I do. I, it's in the best interest of the company and, and I'm always thinking, okay, what's best for the organization, the brand, the company. And, you know, so I, I have no regrets. You know, we sure we could have done things some, you know, better, but ultimately this is, this has been one heck of a ride, man. This is, it's been awesome. Really awesome. Nice. Well, we're, we're turning up here yeah. on the hour. Um, we still have a whole half of the segment left to get to. So are you guys um you guys up for it? You still ready to dig in? Let's do it. All Let's right. Well, we'll start Absolutely. with some questions and then um if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna test some cocktails because you know I'm the bartender extraordinaire. <laughs> Not. <laughs> uh, but uh, I gotta I gotta play with these a little bit. It's really a lot of fun. I will be listening. Okay. I, I promise. But I'm Okay. totally intrigued okay. now with with this magic stuff over here um awesome. so so peter do you want to start do you want to kind of tell us where you're from and how you got started in the industry sure. sure 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 um so born in new jersey i i left at a very young age i've been a south florida you could call me born here but i i mean literally i've spent most of my childhood and my adult life in South Florida, Miami, predominantly now in Fort Lauderdale and, uh, uh, graduated college and went into pharmaceutical business. I worked for Abbott laboratories and, uh, yep. Didn't really tickle my fancy. Um, you know, so, but it really gave me a foundation in sales and understanding business. And I, I really 
I always knew I had a passion for the hospitality industry, cocktails, bartending, and working in restaurants and bars, you know, through college. Okay, always so you had some experience had in, the, in the industry. Yeah. No, I always had a passion yeah. for it and always enjoyed it. And, you know, yeah. and, and, and so I transitioned out of pharmaceutical sales and I went into alcohol sales. I worked at the distributor. I went, worked for NDC. I worked for Southern Glacier. Um, and then I transitioned into the supplier world, worked my way up from managing just to, you know, a city and then to a state, then to a region, then to half the country and then to the country. Um, most recently I was a COO for DeKuyper in the U S I ran their U S organization. I built their U S organization, um, turned it into a very profitable, uh, company. And then prior to that, I was the managing director at De Serono. Um, I played a role in creating the, uh, the business plan to become their own import company. Uh, so they were with Bacardi USA. They were an agency brand. And I, I really understood that in order to get to a place of growth that this brand wanted to do and wanted to be, it, they, they would have to have the focus and the resources to just do it yep. themselves. And so I did that. And so really my expertise lies in building teams and companies and brands. And um, that's kind of been, you know, 20 plus years of, of my industry. I've, I've seen all facets of it worked for the big companies, worked for the small companies, worked for the supplier side and the distributor side. So I've seen everybody's perspective to this industry. And it's, it's really fascinating to, you know, you, you learn something in one side of this thing and then you go to the other side and you're like, Oh yeah, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. So you really gotta, you gotta see behind the right. curtain of sorts and it's, it's fascinating. So uh, it, it's been it's been an, an amazing journey, and then ending up here at Bespoken, like I said to you earlier, has been it's just been it, it's been phenomenal. It's been this this reinvigoration of energy and excitement, and doing something so different and so disruptive that potentially could be something magnificent. And um, and being a part of something like that is is just just awesome yeah. for me. It really, really is. Yeah. You know, you mentioned um, in D.C., you know. <laughs> was that that long ago? <laughs> it was. It was, like, before, it was before there were our in D.C. in Florida. And, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you watch these mega distributors and they go through the transition of losing big suppliers, gaining big suppliers, and it's just this, this vicious cycle, man. <laughs> And, um, you know, you watch these powerhouses come in and out of, of, of power and, you know, but and then I also got a chance to work for Southern and, and that was very interesting. And you see the two very different cultures of the distributor life and, and how these distributors do things. It's so much different though today, Je Jesse. I mean, it's, there, it's such so a different. data driven world that we live yep. in now. Um, you know, I remember in the early days of my career it was all relationships and it was all just being present and, well, and building brands at the distributor level. And that I, I think as we all know is it's a different world that we live in now. I, I think, you know, you, the suppliers now are really the people building the brands. Distributors are offering this logistics platform to deliver and to invoice and, and, and do the necessary things, you know, the blocking and tackling, but it's, it's really up to the suppliers, no matter how big yeah. or small you are to really create, you know, and generate consumer awareness, a consumer pull. And, uh, whereas in the past it was, you would get help. And I, I think that's changed, especially for small brands, startup companies, you know, perhaps mid-level and definitely the bigger brands are, they're, they're definitely very focused and rightfully so these people generate these suppliers generate 98% of their total revenue, you know, so they should focus 98% of their time and energy and resources to that. At least that's the way they see it. And any good businessman would tell you the same. And, you know, so 
I respect that. But at the end of the day, we have a job to do in building this brand and this company. And so we're, we're, we're passionate about doing that. And I think getting some attention from the distributor is the fight that we all fight. Yeah. And it's the challenge that we all deal with as, as a supplier, especially small. And, one. you know, I remember meeting the guy. <laughs> remember when Diageo did this many years ago? They're like, hey, we're going to consolidate and change your lives forever. Yeah, I met a guy yes. in a bar Hope. in Long Island. We yeah. were having wine. I don't even, I think, I don't know if I was out there for the Hamptons one year. I can't even remember why I was out there. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know your industry. I'm a part of this blah, 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 blah. That just did da, 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 da. I'm like, you what? <laughs> you did what? And obviously you reflect on it now um, because that was the change of everything. That was the change of consolidation. Yeah. And it's still going on. It was. That was the You're yeah. seeing. Yeah, I, I will never forget that. That was, he was, that was a historical moment in our industry. It, it changed everything yeah. uh, from this day forward. And that was when the supplier realized and Diageo realized, hey, we represent a vast majority of your revenue or percentage of your revenue. So we want exactly that much attention. As a matter of fact, we want our own sales force. And, you know, it's, it's genius, actually. I mean, I, I get it. And, you know, they've been uber successful and kudos and, and other suppliers have followed suit at the distributor level. Now you have other big suppliers that have their own sales force and, you know, and do you think, you know, you it's, it's looking at it though, Peter, do you think that that move basically mm -hmm. built the top 20 companies or propelled them? Yes. Because it really I was do. a divider between who was big and who was or not even really medium, but small and then really small. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have the startup because I feel like there's a big difference. Yeah. You have the top 20 maybe. And then you have all these middle companies that are just kind of struggling, yeah, you know, trying to get mm -hmm. there that they just can't unless they acquire brands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think both of the the big distributor, all three big distributor partners in the country, R and D C, Southern Glacier, and Breakthrough, they all are cognizant of the sleeping giants or the the brands that could yeah. explode. So they'll look at a bespoken brand like ours and they'll say, hmm. "Is there potential here? You know, do they have the right people involved to create something special here?" Because I've seen great brands, great packages, great tasting juice, and it just, it doesn't work out, you know, and it has all the tools and all the, it should, everything says it should succeed and it, it doesn't because it is uber competitive. It's, Jesse, to build a brand in the U.S., any brand, whether it's alcohol, any consumer good, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, and it's a lot of money. Yeah. So I think people really need to understand whatever business you get in in consumer goods, it's 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 not easy and it's it, it's hard and you have to have something that really sets you apart from everyone else. What makes you different? And I think that's why I'm so enticed by this is there's plenty of great brands out there, plenty of great opportunities out there um, in, in the alcohol space and you know, it's just finding that right niche that, you know, has the potential to really skyrocket and, and be special. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think sometimes when I think about, you know, the, the current distribution model too, it's like you're, you can't squeeze water out of a, out of, out of a, you know, a twisted towel. Right. Right. Like, yeah, they, they can't, they can only do what they can do. And so there has to be more, yeah. or there has to be something else, or there has to be something in addition to that's out there or that's coming. And I think it will. Uh, yeah. And maybe, maybe it's because maybe that's the the model we're kind of looking at seeing now with Greenlight and some of these smaller distributors taking on these smaller brands. Well, they grew so fast they can't hardly take anything else on. So, you, in a, in yeah. a way, hopefully that kind of happens because then that gives room for people like yeah. your company that wants to be nationwide. You know, it gives you that kind of mm -hmm. avenue. Yeah. I think there's a massive opportunity for somebody to come in and, and be that that middle tier uh, distributor partner that takes on 
uh, some of the brand building necessities in distribution. And yeah, I, I'm not sure who that is yet, but I, I think there is an opportunity for somebody to come in who wants to do that. Um, there's just so much power in, in these large distributors and they're hyper, hyper focused, as you know, on, on these large supplier partners and, and, and that's okay. Rightfully so. There's a space it's, for everybody. But yeah, there is a space and there is a, a need for somebody to come in and man, they could cash in. They, I mean, I think it's a, a massive investment at first, but if you have three or four brands just take off. All of a sudden, it's a, it's a whole new ball game, and um, I think people will eventually recognize that if they haven't already and are jumping into this game. No, agreed. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Okay, Scott, <laughs> the engineer. <laughs> I don't know if you're Howard fans or not, but uh, but anyway, I thought I had to say that. Uh, so, do you want to kind of talk about? I know you you mentioned you've kind of been in the Silicon Valley. Um, this is kind of your first foray into it, but, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and kind of maybe a little bit into, um, you know, kind of how you were introduced to this opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I, I have a PhD from, uh, in electrical engineering, uh, from Georgia Tech. I was born and raised here in Kentucky. Um, went to UK for master's and then Georgia Tech for a PhD in electrical engineering. Um, then worked in the semiconductor industry, um, and our, our chairman of the board and then lead investor for Bespoken uh, is TJ Rogers. So he founded a company called Cypress uh, that I worked for uh, for, for 23 years. Um, and he, he resigned from there after my 16th year in 2016 and got into venture capitalism. So that's when he was investing primarily in energy companies, so solar and, and battery uh, technologies. He still is. He still uh, is chairman, executive chairman of several different uh, energy companies. And um, so he knew me pretty well uh, from, from the time that, that I worked at Cypress. Um, but more importantly, he knew about the office that, that my mentor, Alan Hawes, built here in Lexington. So he's the one that hired me uh, in Lexington to come back home and, and work here after grad school. Um, and so he and I started an office, built the office, um, had about 80 employees locally. Uh, and my job was managing design engineers around the world. I had uh, groups in Colorado, in Ireland, uh, in San Jose, California, India, Bangalore, um, and about 100 people. And um, that's, yeah, so TJ called me um, and said, did you know I have a bourbon startup? And I said, I, I just heard about it from Alan. And, uh, literally the next day, Peter was on an airplane, met me here in Lexington. Uh, and TJ has, uh, wrote a book called no excuses management. So he doesn't, uh, he doesn't miss words and he, he's very direct. And he said that Peter will be there tomorrow make sure he meets the mayor and the governor and, <laughs> and goes to all the distilleries yeah. and, and meets all the important people in the bourbon business. And so, uh, with Alan's help, we, we got him to meet the mayor, which was amazing. Um, at least one important person in the bourbon industry. I was in front. Um, I was. In front. I was. And, and we got a, we got a tour at Buffalo Trace. Nice. Uh, so we went up there and, um, so Peter got to see that. And then, uh, literally the next day we're, we're flying on TJ's private jet back to, back to California to meet the R and D team. Um, several of <laughs> which have joined us here now in Lexington, uh, relocated here. Um, had a, had a meeting with the team. Uh, I finally tasted the, the juice, um, which, which I immediately loved. Um, and I think it was at the Marriott bar where, where Peter wrote, wrote the red offer on a napkin. And I said, hell yeah, let's go. So, um, so that was how I got into this. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I kind of did. Um, you know, what, what I've loved is the learning is the, not just about the, the chemistry and the, the science of, of the spirits, but I'm really curious about the marketing aspects. The three tier system kind of baffles me as a newcomer I get to it. this. I get it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's like, I've learned clearly where, you know, the, the roots of the system are, you know, coming out of prohibition with the federal government wanting, uh, 
you know, controls over producers. Um, but to me, that's antiquated and, and, and the, the industry needs to be re rethought, you know, from a, from a business and you know, perspective. And I think we're kind of rethinking it from a technology uh, perspective, but I'm certain mm -hmm. it's not going to be, hopefully in my lifetime, uh, we'll rethink this and make, you know, make the best products that we can get to consumers for the best value and reward the right people for doing that. Um, so that's been exciting to learn. Um, I've spent three months being a chief financial officer, I feel like for this company, um, yep. which has been also exciting, you know, learning everything we're spending, everything we're doing, the, the, the breadth of it is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as an engineer, understanding physical processes, uh, understanding these financial processes as well. It's been, been really exciting. Uh, so just learning every day, uh, it's been, you know, I, I don't consider this work. Don't tell my boss, by the way, but <laughs> this is fun. This doesn't work. I heard that, right. Scott. I heard <laughs> you. Uh, but no, I'm having a blast. Uh, doing it in my hometown is, is a bonus. Yeah. Um, so it's been great. So, Scott, what kind of yeah. engineer programming were you, what What did you create? Uh, semiconductors. So, okay. um, we, uh, we made chips that are in your cell phone. We made chips that are in your, in your automobile, um, mostly in, in the entertainment system and in the interior of the car, window controllers, doors, switches, lights, motors, um, made a lot of IOT devices and other things, um, wireless, wireless communications chips. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited once we get stabilized, once we're in, in the facility here in Kentucky, we're producing regularly. Uh, I intend to kind of revisit that and get into more automation, um, first with sensing, but then also into controlling, uh, the equipment. So, you know, I, I can envision a day when you wake up on Sunday morning and you look at your phone and it tells me that fermenter number three is here, activator two is there <laughs> and you want to turn that one down, throttle that one up, you know, uh, do that all from, from your bedroom. So, um, that that's been my life is has been in automation and controls. So, um, one of these days, Peter, Peter might let me bring that back into the business. <laughs> yes. Scott has actually been seamlessly transitioned into this world. I, I it's, it, he has been incredible for us. Um, I, I, I've dealt with many people with the scope of work that he does and uh, heads and tails above them. I mean, he is incredible and uh, we're lucky to have him. So I, I, he's now considered my, my work wife. So <laughs> Everybody's got to have one. <laughs> so I, we, talk every, I, we talk every day and a lot, a lot. Sometimes I have to tell him not to call me for like two days on Saturday. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> so, no, but in all seriousness, it, it's Scott is brilliant. He's, he's done an incredible job with the, the organization and, really a remarkable job just building the train you know leading the transition from you know san francisco to uh, lexington has been amazing he's had so he has so many connections here in lexington we he knows so many people it's such a small knit community here in lexington that you know everybody knows everybody it's it's a really kind and warm community in Lexington and they, they've welcomed us with open arms. And, um, so we're, we're, we're lucky to be where we are and we're lucky to have Scott too. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, that's a huge transition. Um, but yet not so far from what you were doing in the sense of the, I mean, PhD is pretty impressive. Like you can kind of translate that, I think over to kind of what you're doing. I mean, just listening to you talk about uh, how you test and how you go about it. It's a very methodical and scientific approach to it that it, it certainly, I, I mean, it, it seems like it's very, um, transferable, at least from, from how you're explaining it to me, uh, you know, just being on this mm -hmm. podcast. So hopefully that, um, and you mentioned earlier, it was kind of a, you know, resurge of energy to kind of do something different. So that's, that's really great. Um, and just yeah. think of all the happy people you get to, you know, at yeah. the end of their day, they get to have project. Of passion. Yeah. They, yes. It's just happy all around. Yeah. Yeah. We, we Jesse, we have a, a saying here, we sling booze. Yeah. <laughs> so, at the end of the day, you know, we're, 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 
we're creating a good time. We're using some pretty cool technology and, you know, we're, we're making hopefully people smile and happy with what they're tasting and drinking. So well, it's not, I'm it's happy. not that complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yep, well, good. I so did, much. <laughs> I did make the Boulevardier. Um, this is not a orange nice. twist. <laughs> this is a slice, but whatever is yummy. <laughs> yummy. Um, well done. It looks good. It looks professional. I will give you that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many people you'd want to admit that. Show me again. Show me again. <laughs> show me. It looks good okay, on good. screen. I'm right. just saying. Well, if I if Pretty I good. see you in tails, <laughs> I won't share that with anybody. <laughs> uh, it's pretty good though. That's that was that fun. Was, maybe it's the maybe it's the visual on the screen. Can't yeah, see that well. It's it's a. Uh, it's a big, it's a big slice. But anyway, okay. yeah, maybe you're right, I right. do like the extra orange. Yeah. I always do that. I do that in the uh, old fashions too. Awesome. It's personal Love preference. It. Love it. Don't judge. Don't judge me, yeah. right? Yeah. No, don't not you. Judge. I'm just saying in general, like, don't judge my giant <laughs> slice of orange. <laughs> At least not a whole orange on top. So that would, that would create some, some, some yeah. challenges. Drinking. <laughs> that would be, you know certainly take away from the yeah. elegance of the drink yeah. i would agree yeah for sure uh yeah. so peter do you want to kind of help us move on here and talk a little bit about some mentors sure. that you've had throughout your career that you want to mention sure um yeah i you know for me i would call myself especially as i've gotten older in my career curious and i think curious people love to learn and I, I have a passion for learning and, and I love to read. Um, I love business books. I love, I, I have a Zen feel to me as well. Like I, my, my favorite book is think like a monk. Uh, it really kind of gives perspective. Um, you know, uh, as far as mentors in this industry, I've worked for some great people. I've worked for, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, recently at DeKuyper, I worked for the global CEO, uh, Mark DeWitt. Um, previous to that, uh, at DeSerrano, I was with uh, Brett Dunn. All impacted me. Uh, Joe Fortune, who's now the CEO for uh, Jägermeister in Terramana Tequila. He's on our board. He, he's a great mentor to me from a finance perspective. He was a CFO over at Serrano when I was there, you know, and then people just in the industry that, that have impacted me. It's, it, it, it's, it's not just learning. It's also words, you know, just somebody who's supportive and yep. believes in you that have really create that, you know, the, just the, the wherewithal to go ahead and, 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 and jump into something that maybe you're not so sure of, you know, and, I think every role I've gone into, you know, I was, I didn't know everything, you know, but I was, I was keen on learning everything and, and being a part of it and, and really growing through that. So, um, yeah, so I, I, again, I've been around some great people. I've been around some not so great people. So I've, I've learned not just how I want to do things, but I also learned what I don't want to do and how I don't want to act and proceed. And, you know, it's, I think leading with passion and directness and accountability is, is, is a big proponent for my management style and leadership style. Um, so, you know, overall it's, yeah, again, some, some awesome people, but I think what it goes, goes down to Jesse is, is, is just being keen on learning and, and getting better every day. And, um, I, I try to not just with my, my team members, even with my children, you know, it's like, continue to learn always learn always keep learning and, and keep going forward that way because i think you said it on the podcast once you stop learning and you become stagnant it kind of it it's it's it, it's not a good thing it's not so yeah so overall that's that's me that's that's my inspirations in this industry and how i you know people that have influenced me overall um i've you know worked for some great great people yeah and i think you know with every every career, you're going to run into the greats and the and the not so greats, 
and that helps shape who you are yeah. as a leader. You know, everybody's experienced Agreed. both, right? Or hopefully at this some is... point you get to experience yeah. the good. Yeah. I know it's, you know, sometimes challenging in our industry. I think that's changing uh, for the better. Even um, when you look at some of the the bigger, uh, older organizations, I think there's been a lot of great change there. And that's that's really important when it comes to leadership and, and creating leaders. You know, as... This is people jump and do different yeah. things or whatever it is and um i liked your um zen part Thank as you. well because yeah. you, you definitely have that that spirit in you uh that calming mm -hmm. effect yeah. and so i think that that's mm -hmm. that's how you balance out the noise <laughs> right and the the rush yeah. and the craziness there's of, a lot yeah because um you know yeah. Taking time out to yeah. pause or to um, meditate or to take that time, you know, you, you definitely the, the, feel, I feel that energy from you that you have that balance, which is really great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I try, I try to have certain balances that there's, I feel like as this, as CEO of a startup company, you're always on call. You always have to be sharp. So when I do have my time, whether it's with family or exercise or meditation or reading or just being with my dogs, you know, it's, um, uh, it's something I cherish and I really I enjoy and I really enjoy what I do too. Yeah, you, know, that's great. Well, you know, being here, it's, it's not, it's work, but it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's hard, but it's, it's, it's when you're working with something that you love to do and you're passionate about it's 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 okay when it's hard yeah. in my opinion yeah even though it's hard it's still exciting you're still pushing yourself to do something that's that's different that is unique and it kind of gives you that that good good energy and good spirit behind it agreed agreed 100 percent. yeah scott would you like to talk about your mentors and any resources yeah i, I gotta start it's cliche. I'll, I'm gonna start with family. Okay. Uh, first, my sister. Awesome. My sister is uh, four four years older than me, and when I was 14 and she was 18, she showed me everything not to do <laughs> that you'll get caught doing, <laughs> and your parents will ground you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so I'm what, sure she loves she's that. Like, Why are you? You're such a perfect. Oh yeah, she does. Now she does. Uh, but yeah, so we, uh, you know, we fought a lot and. She taught me what not to do and asked me why I was such a perfect kid. I'm like, I, I just watched you and I learned how to not get caught. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, circling around, my dad bought me a computer when there weren't, when, when that wasn't really much of a thing. Uh, oh, in yeah. the early 80s. Yeah. And so I figured that out. Uh, embarrassing story, sort of. The only time I was ever grounded when I didn't follow my sister's advice, uh, I skipped trumpet practice. And I was I was uh, banned from using the computer for a whole weekend. Oh no! <laughs> oh uh... boy! I had to like go ride a bicycle. It was terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then my my mom was uh, she was a first grade English teacher or first grade grammar teacher, well, grammar school. Uh oh! And uh, when I was when I was nerding out and taking all the science classes, she's like, "You have to take public speaking and and technical writing." No son of mine is going to grow up without being able to talk or write, um, <laughs> which I've met a lot of engineers who can't talk and can't write. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that more than anything. Uh, Good going, but Mom. Then a couple of, you know, a couple of, yeah, a couple of faculty, you know, uh, public school teachers in Lexington made a big difference. I, I had a, a trig teacher when I was in a junior in high school who actually took time out of his evening two weeks into the year to call my parents on the phone at dinner and say, your son is really bored. We need to get him into more advanced classes. That's, 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 so that really kicked forward. That is so great. Thank you, you for know, that teacher. That level stuff. Because I don't, yeah, absolutely. I don't, Mr. Silent. I don't think that was probably normal back then. You know, I mean, no, to, to call a parent in the middle of the middle of the evening. Yeah. Cause my nephews get that attention in, in a big, school district like Dallas, you know, DISD is huge and there's gazillion opportunities for kids. 
um, you know, there in a, in a pretty big metro. I grew up in a town of, you know, less than a thousand people. We had eight, some, some tag classes or something, but be, to be able to have a, a teacher take that much interest in making sure, because it could be, it could be, uh, translated as something different than that, you know, where this, this teacher is insightful enough to go, look, this, this kid isn't challenged, <laughs> but we need to give him more, you know, it's pretty cool. Or, yeah. Yeah. That was fantastic. And, you know, really, again, the, the classes that I changed into really accelerated my, you know, my education and, and got me where I am. So that was, that was huge. Um, yeah. Then in, in grad school at UK, I had, uh, Kentucky, uh, had a hey. kind of burly old engineer. He smoked a pipe every day. It was great because nice. when you walked in the building, you could tell whether he was there or not. <laughs> Just immediately in the building, you'd be like, oh, Clayton's in today. Uh, that so feels I can go good talk though, to him. right? So, Back in the day, it used to be like pure, really yeah. good stuff, Account. right? Account. Yeah, they, you know, this was I in the it... transition period when he, he, you know, for a while he would just smoke anywhere he was. Huh. Then, then he, then they made him shut his door. <laughs> then they made him go outside. <laughs> and then he resigned. Then he retired. I think. Uh -huh. So suck him thugs. Um, but he, I, I was finishing my master's, and I was, I knew I wanted to get a PhD, and so I walked into his office and I said, Doctor Paul, can I, you know, I, I want to get a PhD. Do you think I should stay here at Kentucky? And he said, son, uh, Kentucky can give you as good of a PhD and as good of an education in electrical engineering as any school in the country. Now shut the door. <laughs> so I shut the door and he said, get out of here, go to some somewhere with prestige and reputation. Uh, it'll change your life. So I really did. Yeah, Georgia Tech is legit, man. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And you sure. said you went overseas? Yeah, so those were early on the rest. I'm you, sorry? Didn't you mention you went overseas? I, I had a team working for me in uh, Ireland and another in India. So I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in those countries. Also in, in China, yeah. uh, we had a, a big group there. So I've, I've traveled a bunch with, with the engineering career. Um, I thought you mentioned you so did that, some yeah, studying overseas. Oh, no. oh, no. Okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood no, that. No. My bad. No. And then, and then, you know, since I've been back in Lexington, for 24 years now, um, really just the, the leadership at, at Cypress with TJ, with Alan, um, you know, critical thinking and, and challenging everything. Uh, it's been what I've learned from them. Um, also to, to remove emotion from the problems. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to get, you know, it's your fault. It's your fault. No, it's, you know, we're up against something really hard. Um, and so removing emotion is a big part of success. I think. Yeah. In anything. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Emotional intelligence yeah, is a and thing. Peter's, very good. <laughs> I think Peter's been in a bunch of stressful environments, uh, including this one. Um, you know, I would say our, our board meetings are intense. Uh, they, they feel like a Silic Silicon Valley board meeting. Um, and, and I've never been to a, a different one, but from what I've heard that most companies in, in the alcohol industry, it's, it's more, uh, it's a little more laid back, a little more, uh, less pressure, oh, but you know, the value of that is, is the motivation, the, you know, the, the desire to learn more, to be better, uh, is super high and, and that's been very stimulating as well. Yeah, that's very true. Well, I mean, the board probably mm -hmm. that you're facing is the owners, right? It's their, their skin in the game. So versus a, a board that, yeah, maybe they get paid to to whatever it is a year, you know, or it's just a prestige mm -hmm. thing. So opinions yeah a little bit different than yeah and yeah i will say this our board uh and i say it to scott every time we walk out of a board meeting it it's almost it's like getting a college degree a phd because I'm, I'm we're literally speaking to some of the smartest human beings on yeah. planet earth on that board <laughs> and it's 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 it, it's fascinating for me I mean, it's, it's challenging, it, it's stressful. And, you know, once you walk out of it and it's just the perspective that you gain and the knowledge that you gain is, is unlike anything I, I've dealt with in my career. I've been in many board meetings in the alcohol industry 
it's not even remotely close to what we do here. And, you know, and I think that's yeah, a great is. thing. I think that, that all of us much better uh, overall, and it makes the company stronger and better, I believe. So yeah, Scott is spot on. So moving on to, um, pay for Scott, did you mention your resources? Any resources in which sense? Well, I mean, is there any um, podcasts or websites or books or anything that kind of helped you throughout your career that you might want to mention? Maybe something in, in you know, as you transitioned into our industry? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it's the employees here. Uh, I've learned most of what I've learned from the, from the people in the company here. Um, you know, I found a, a willingness to, to, to share and, and help. Um, and I think we have a very transparent nature uh, about us, uh, about the 13 or 14 employees we have. Um, everybody's very open. Uh, everybody wants to help. Um, so there's a, a big camaraderie among the team here. Um, in terms of the bourbon industry, honestly, it's been, um, you know, growing up in Kentucky, um, I literally to this day, my Facebook profile picture from probably 1990 two or three is me in a Georgia Tech sweatshirt at the home of Maker's Mark. Um, I was, you know, when they, when they first opened tours and dipping bottles, uh, when it wasn't really a big thing, um, uh, we went there. Um, so just the history in, in that industry and then living in Atlanta, living in Pittsburgh for a few years, your neighbors, your friends learn that you're from Kentucky and they want to talk about it and ask about it. So that was motivation to learn. Um, you know, more recently, it's been, um, you know, some contacts at the University of Kentucky. Uh, there's an amazing um, institute in the agriculture department. It's funded by Jim Beam. Um, they now have a distillery. They have a rack house. Nice. They're, they're doing the full uh, the full deal there. Um, in fact, one of the ideas we have was since since you can get a degree uh, in, in agriculture with the distilling certificate at UK, in shorter time than a barrel will age. Um, what we're, what we're going to offer and what we have offered is let's take some of the d dis distillate right off the still, the white dog, and let's run our process on it. And we'll, we'll together decide a standard, um, you know, aging profile for, for our system. And then a week later, these graduates who have made white dog and put it in the rack house can actually taste what it might be like, uh, in four or five years. So that's. Wow. You know, that, that's a, a great example of how we're, we're, we're part of That is Kentucky. super cool. Yeah, that's a whole, yeah, you know, that's I, a whole I, other like leg the of the elephant. <laughs> like you said, Peter, right? Wow. Oh, that is. We could spend an hour on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, books, I've read the Bourbon Bible. I've read uh, several guides to distilling books, on, you know, that I found. Um all of which are, are valuable. I've, I've got a friend who's a chemistry professor and I'm taking her online uh, organic chemistry classes, um, which has been been fun. Um, and then in terms of podcasts, The Bourbon Pursuit, you know, I think is, is pretty well known. Um, I listen to those guys a lot. Um, and yeah, that's it. We, you know, we've partnered with attorneys here in town, with uh, the mayor's office, with uh, many others that have, have been very helpful whenever there's questions or, or issues. Yeah, that's great. A real community brand. But I can tell you one thing. It is. I can tell you, though, and I, I should have started this a year ago. There is no book on how to build a distillery. No. Uh, it is. Yes. Or build a team. It is. A... And I don't think any. Yeah. I don't think any one person knows how to do it. Uh, the the breadth uh, and the 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 disjointed requirements, the, you know, understanding what, what exactly needs to be done, uh, is, is, is a journey. And, and I think, uh, yeah, I think there's an opportunity for someone to write a, a book on how to do that. There you go, Scott. <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Scott. <laughs> You're the processor, the PhD, the engineer, you, you can do it. Right. I just need a sabbatical, yeah. Peter. Can you, can you fund a sabbatical for me for six months? No. <laughs> In 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. There we go. When I've forgotten it all. Perfect. Yes. Yes. That's, that's why you need yes. to film it. <laughs> film it. Film it. Film it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We, we, 
we we could be the next great Netflix documentary, there you guys. Go. But gotta have it. We missed we missed our gotta it's have it. It's not too late. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's never too late. Yeah. Just gotta pay somebody to do that. Yeah, you'll have that. <laughs> you'll be able to do that later. <laughs> Don't worry about the money. Just yeah. get the content. Get it. Get yeah. It. College yep. kids are great for that stuff. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. No, I, I have a I have a, a 19 year old son who's a film student, oh. so I, I I always dangle the carrot. I'm like, I'll pay a hundred bucks. You know? There you go. <laughs> Look, this yeah. is this is no a doubt. you know big deal. Like he could put it really put his name out there. But good, that's what I said. Yeah, he does. Listen. Yeah, he's not going to yet. He's busy. He's too young. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's too savvy. Yeah, is what he is. is he's too smart right now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. So are there um, awesome. any pain points in the industry that either of you would like to kind of tackle that, um, you know, obviously are relevant to what you guys are doing today? I think the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, for, for me, I, I think I touched on it, Jesse. I think, you know, it's it's the whole process of building a brand, how, how challenging, how expensive and time consuming and, and really having the patience to go through the necessary steps in the process, yeah. you know, and building a brand and I, I'm putting the artist partnership aside for a second, but building the bespoken brand and the technology, you can't skip steps, you know, and there's no cheating that process. And no matter how much money you throw at it, it's still a process that you have to go through and you, you do have to earn it. I mean, it's so rare to have lightning in a bottle today. Right? It's, it just, yeah, it's one out of, I don't know how many thousands of brands, you know? And so for, for me that that's frustrating, but it, I, I have an understanding and an appreciation for it. Uh, you know, obviously we touched on distribution, how challenging that can be and, and getting share of mind. Um, but ultimately, again, you know, we control our destiny by going out there and building. We have an understanding that there's no misconception that somebody's going to do something for us. If we're going to grow this and build this, it's going to come from us. And I'll turn it over to Scott because I know he's got a laundry list. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I've touched on a bunch of them. So, you know, the three tier system um, doesn't make a lot of sense. I think um, that's that's you know I'm I'm measured on gross margin, and yeah. my margins are based on the revenue that we earn on the bottle that we sell to the distributor, and then on top of that, the distributor has their cut, and then the retailer has their cut, and mm -hmm. so you know my revenues are half of what the consumer is paying, and I, I'm not there's no other industry I can imagine where that's anywhere similar, um, so that. You know that that's a challenge, very technical, boring challenge. Um, the, the cost of everything, you know, everybody's facing that in life. Um, uh, it's crazy. Um, but the interesting thing in the in the spirits industry is that we're seeing um, a COVID bubble, is what I like to call it. So when COVID hit, uh, the distillers stopped producing. You know, right away when they were shutdowns. Then they were reestablished as, as essential uh, employees yeah. as mm -hmm. they were making hand sanitizer and whatnot, simply God, the ethanol they were mm -hmm. producing. Um, but all of that led to six months, a year, 18 months, something like that, of people not yeah. filling barrels anymore. And so, um, you know, that we're now three years oh, past man. that. And so to find a three year distillate uh, in, in, the, in the world God. is is expensive. But, but now we're seeing that two year and one year and new fills are becoming much more economical. It's come back down. Um, so it's interesting to watch that because of this aging process that, that we all, uh, you know, that is pervasive in the industry, you know, we're seeing that delayed effect of COVID kind of ripple through. So that's been something that we've been challenged to manage around. That is not something uh, that well. I, I could have ever thought was going on in our industry. It yeah. just did dawn on me like that at I mean, all. Interesting. Yeah. You're you're not yeah, alone. Yeah. You know, a lot, it, it caught a lot off guard. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we were at 
at the wrong time with uh, the straight bourbon needs that we had a year ago. Um, and so, you know, that, that's been a big challenge, something that's, that the industry is, you know, it's facing the whole industry. Um, but there's, there's also the lingering question, and I don't have the right answer for the industry, um, but that is uh, the uh, ramp of production. So, you know, I, I toured a lot of distilleries when tourism opened in the 90s uh, in, in the bourbon world in Kentucky. Um, then I didn't because I'd been there, you know, and I wasn't in the industry. Um, but in the last year, I've been visiting all of them again, you know, learning more, seeing, visiting people. Um, been amazed and, and warmed by the transparency of the industry. Uh, there's really a sense that that rising tides float all boats and a lot of cooperation and, and, and openness uh, in the industry, which is great. Um, but every place I go to, I'm seeing they're full bore 24 seven. They're spending like crazy. And so I do have a lingering concern for the industry that uh, we're, we're approaching an overproduction point uh, where we might see collapses and, and just the flight prices and, and it, it may make it more difficult to compete. The, on the plus side for us, I think our technology kind of separates us from that, uh, it insulates us from that that issue. And if it does, if it is true, um, you know, I think we'll be we'll be ready to yep. you know, take the shake, take the cheap distillate. That only is going to help us in the long run. And we don't you know, we don't have to make gin for three years like any new like any new distillery. We we've got we've got products on the shelf now. As soon as I open in Kentucky, literally the very next day, I'll have product for sale that was made here. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, I think we're hopefully power. insulated from that, but it is a concern. There's a lot of power in that statement. Yep. Absolutely. Great. That, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty powerful mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, Thanks. that's that's awesome. Keep that's awesome. technology. <laughs> Jesse, do you have a few million dollars you'd like to invest in bespoken while we're while we're on the call here? Oh, I love to. I would absolutely love to. I would if I could, because this is so fun. Uh, you know, oh, so cool. Uh, any outlook you guys want to speak about for 2024 or anything? I mean, even if it's not bourbon related, any kind of trend or some kind of outward thing that you're sensing? I want to think from our personal standpoint for us, I think um, we're, we're still poised to more than double our business again this this coming year. That's great. Um, I think we, yeah, we, we've significantly, we've, we've taken a lot of learnings and understanding. You know, last year we, we developed five new SKUs. You know, I, I don't know if people really understand how hard that is for a company our size to actually do and to, to launch into 10 states. And so for us, we learned so much and we're, we're going to be immensely better this year. And where we have a new artist partnership starting this year, probably about mid year. And, um, so we won't make the same mistakes. So I, I feel great about the future that we have and that we're, we're the, the, the trend that we're in. Um, I think from an overall standpoint of the industry, I think we're, we're in an election year. I think you're going to see, you know, I, I would consider myself, uh, not a skeptic. I'm always looking at the positive side of things. And, and I think we're, we're, we're poised to kind of transition into better times. I think we, you know, inflation was, was devastating, especially for folks that are on fixed incomes. And so, you know, going out and buying, you know, the nice things, it wasn't always there for people over the past couple of years. And I think it, my hopes are, is that that transitions and that, that, that looks different and things start to kind of level out and even out and, um, things will <laughs> look a lot yeah. better. And I, and I mean that in, in every facet of the economic state, you know, world that we're in right now. And so, um, uh, I'm excited for that because that's only good for us too. I think for everybody. Well, Scott, would you, anything you want to add? No, I agree. Yeah, we're a we're a at the end of the day we're a luxury brand for consumers, right? We 
people that buy our products are it's disposable income. So, you know, the macro economy affects everyone, every business. Um, but us, I think even more so, um, you know, than, you know, people making consumer goods, for example. Um, but yeah, I share Peter's optimism. I think, um, I think our technology and our, our, I think we're situated in a good spot. And so we're, we'll ride the waves, uh, that come with us, but, uh, I do like, I do like our chances moving forward. Yeah, I do too. So in, in, in final here, we have passions outside of work. (laughs) Which one wants to go, which one you guys want to go first? I'll go first. I guess I'll go ahead, Scott, please. (laughs) Wait, does drinking count or is that part of work? Yes. I don't I don't know. Uh, uh, I didn't want to go there, you know? <laughs> yes, it counts. So uh you know, for me it's it's uh outdoors and family and singing. So I'm a huge karaoke fan. Nice. Um, What's your song? I wish I could play guitar and anything by Johnny Cash. Uh it's all good. That's a um and you play but guitar? Uh, yeah, the, the world's best karaoke bar. The world's best karaoke bar is here in Lexington, Shinoi Pub. So shout out to Kusu. Nice. Uh, he <laughs> grabbed our red label off the shelf pretty quick uh, once he heard about this. And uh, But yeah, I'd have to mm-hmm. say friends and uh, water, sailing, oceans. Um, but I appreciate them a lot more than Peter, who lives on one. Because um, I only get to see it a few weeks a year. Um <laughs> Uh, and then, and then karaoke. That's awesome. So you're a music guy. Absolutely. And you play guitar. I, I can play two chords, maybe three. Um, but not while doing anything else. Uh, <laughs> I have to be concentrated and, and thinking only about that chord. So, um, no, I've got a friend who plays, we sing a bit and play and, uh, but no, it's, it's not a career. Trust me. <laughs> it's not a career. Well, that's awesome. You enjoy it. That's all that counts. Scott's a pretty good singer. Nice. I'll give him that. He's all right. No. <laughs> He's all right. He's all right. He's all right. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I, I'm a lot simpler. I, I love the outdoors too. I love I I love the beach. Um, I I, I swear I'm part lizard because I love the sunshine, and uh, I love to be outside. I love to exercise and you know um, be in the gym, you know, every day. I've yeah, as I've gotten older, you know, the body starts to break down a bit. So I appreciate the time when I'm not broken, when I get to go to the gym and do fun things. And uh, so, yeah, overall, and then family and friends are, you know, really super important to me. I love camaraderie and, and just being around people and and and, uh, and family, especially. So that's that's more awesome. Yeah. Well, I did think of one cool. thing we haven't really talked about, and that was the price points. Do you want to quickly just talk about price points and then, you know, a little bit of, you know, about your website and how to get in touch with you guys or find a bottle? Sure. Um, well, it depends on states that you're in, but, you know, everything ranges from, I'd say, forty one ninety nine to forty nine ninety nine, right in that range. Um, and, uh the website's www.bespokenspirits.com. Um, we have, we're on all social media, Instagram, um, Facebook, um, you know, LinkedIn, you know, come join us, come check us out. Um, we're on, all of our brands are on e-commerce. Um, so available, I think it's in 35 states, if I remember nice. correctly. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. Any yeah. any final cool. thoughts or words, yeah. Scott? Yeah. Or Peter? No, I appreciate this, Jesse. Yeah, your your questions are very insightful. Make me think as well, which which I appreciate very much. Um, this has mm-hmm. been a very enjoyable time. So thank you for you for your yeah. time as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll do a podcast and drink at any time with <laughs> okay. you. Just well, us, I you love know. this. This is you know this is my this is my fun time, right? Like I get to meet amazing yeah. people that are doing amazing things and. Thank you so much for being so generous to let me try all your different um, flavors, I guess, or SKUs, if you will. Um, they're amazing. I loved all of them, you know, for their differences. 
Um, I did make an old fashioned with the bourbon and yum. It is really yummy. <laughs> so, so, so good. I didn't use simple syrup. I just Trim. used um, some of the syrup from the cherries. Uh, but, but yeah, it was yum. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, really good. Really good job, guys. Awesome technology. Um, rooting for you, you 100%. Right. So good stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Alrighty. I really well, enjoyed take it. Take care. All right. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> oh, man. Peanut. That was fun, guys. This week's episode was produced by Fedora J Productions.